The Alliance San Diego has worked on projects towards civil rights, immigration, gender equality, and social reform issues in San Diego. Christopher Wilson, our guest speaker, is formerly the Director of Civil Engagement. He built out the Alliance San Diego Civic Engagement Program to ensure that the voice of communities of color, low income, and immigrant communities are included in the civic process. Christopher received a bachelor's degree in history and ethnic studies from the University of San Diego and was the first African-American student government president at the university. Raised in blue collar neighborhoods of Detroit, he has lived in many foreign countries and traveled to many others. His work is centered on empowering communities of color and low income communities through building bridges, creating collaborations on common issues and leadership development. Christopher's life experience, education, training, and work give him a deep understanding of the complexities involved with creating empowered communities amidst oppression and class segregation. He is inspired by his family, artists, coworkers, colleagues, and community leaders who keep him honest and hopeful. Family, please join me in welcoming Christopher. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ecstatic to be with you today. Um, I am overjoyed with the pledge of $1 million to the Movement for Black Lives. I am so honored that Lorraine and Bertine asked me to speak to you today. And um, I'm happy to be with the, the All One family to talk about some important issues in our community and how we can uh, heal as a country, heal as a community, heal inside your company. It's a, it's a great honor to be with you today. Um, I want to first start out by, you know, giving a little context to Juneteenth because some folks may be saying, why is it a holiday? Like, we all know slaves got free, but why do we have a day to honor when, you know, this happened in Galveston, Texas? Well, the, the truth of the matter is that the slaves in Texas were freed upon the announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. The word of the Emancipation Proclamation was not delivered to the slaves in Texas until June 19th, 1965. The significance is the Civil War ended in April of 1965. So the folks who were still enslaved in Texas had been free for two and a half years by the Emancipation Proclamation before they got the word in June of 1865. To further um, insult this 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 um, freedom was the fact that the Civil War ended in April, and at the end of the Civil War, all slaves had been free by then. So these folks were still held in two and a half years beyond when they should have been freed. And and you know, mainstream society likes to tell us today that well, you know, news didn't travel fast back then. Well, it didn't take two and a half months to get from Washington, D.C. to Texas, even back then. It didn't take the mail two and a half months to get from Washington, D.C. to Texas, even back then. Um, and so the fact of the matter is that the slave owners in Texas held their slaves in bondage beyond when they were supposed to. And, and that's no accident. They were in to the United States. So that's just a, a small context for how, even though laws might change in America, people's actions can still have a heavier impact on everyday lives um, than we wanted to have and go outside of the law that was created to protect those folks. Um, and so I'll be talking to you today about my lived experience as an African-American, as a black man in America, um, in the context of, you may think laws change, and they do, but laws don't necessarily change our society. Laws, laws don't change people's hearts and minds. Only people can do that. And so I want to share my story with you in the hopes of inspiring uh, folks to become allies, um, inspiring folks to have a change of heart if necessary, and just you know, humanize the experience that folks are watching on TV today as we watch uprisings take root 
across this country, I mean, actually around the world, um, to protest the killing of yet another black man, you know, in the in the custody of police, and to watch this black man die on film, on camera. Um, we want to make sure, I want to make sure that folks know that that's not a singular incident. That as a black man in America, I think you'd be hard pressed to find one who could truthfully say they had never experienced racism or um, a, an abuse of power just because they're they're black. Um, and, and again, I don't want to just, I'm a black man, so I'm speaking from a black man's experience, but black women, black LGBTQ folks, black trans folks, we all, you know, live in this country and under the foot of racism and and still strive every day to be successful. Um, and so I'm going to start with my experience. And when I first realized that I was black, and you may be surprised to know that that was at the age of three or four years old. Um, black kids know what it means to live in a white society. Um, in preschool, the kids, I was much more fair skinned than I am today. Um, and my mom would tell it, she, she had trouble because I looked like a little white kid. Um, and people would always question her about, you know, my connection to her. But the kids in my preschool, convinced me that I was white and not in a negative way. I went to all black preschool uh, in Detroit in the in the center of where the riots took place, completely African-American neighborhood. I was so fair skinned that the kids convinced me that I was white and that wasn't a bad experience because because I was white, they all wanted to be my friend and they wanted to hold my hand when we would walk in between um, classes or go to lunchroom or whatever because they even then they knew that being closer to a white person might get them more privileges or more goodies or more favoritism from the teacher. And so they would they would fight and argue over who was gonna hold my hand as we walked to the bathroom or as we walked to lunch. Um, and in convincing me that I was white, I took that message home to my mom. And my mom said, boy, you're not white, you black. I'm black, you black. And I said, no, I'm not. And so she sat me down and she talked about my family and our history. And I, I mean, I still have a recollection today from three or four years old of the, this conversation and how significant it was because I was convinced that I was white. And I was a little let down when I found out that I wasn't. So I went back to school and I told all the kids, I'm not white, y'all, I'm black. And they said, no, that woman ain't your mother. She's dark skinned. That can't be your mom. Um, and I said, what? And they said, no, she's lying to you. She's taking care of you and she needs you to do what she says. So she tells you she's your mom and all this other stuff. And, and, and I was like, oh, I'm being tricked. And I went home and I had an argument with my mother and I finally let it out. I said, you're not my mom. And, you know, growing, growing up when I grew up, that, that created something in her. And the reaction was a, a, a slap across the face. You know, wake up, boy, you black, I'm your mama, and ain't nobody coming to get you, and you ain't going to nobody else's house, you black, and you need to stop listening to them kids at school. Um, and what that taught me was my family history, because my mother had to get the family album out and point to all of my grandparents, point to all of my aunts and uncles, my cousins, and say, this is your family. This is where you come from. We come from Louisiana, before Louisiana, we were in Virginia. We were part African slave, part Cherokee Indian. And, and this is your family heritage. And so at a very young age, I was introduced to what it meant to be black. I was introduced to the difference between black and white. Um, <clears throat> and I've carried that with me my entire life. It, it was, a, it was a, a, a very significant experience in my life. And, and it's what I go back to when I have a situation that is based on my skin tone or my skin color. Um, I go back to that as a foundation of who I am and, and a formation of my identity. You know, um, and, and each time I, I have an interaction with someone who asks me, are you mixed? Are you biracial? Um, your hair is straight? You are fair skin, you know, one, your mom or your dad must be white. I go back to that experience as a three or four year old. 
And I say, no, I'm African American. I'm black. My mom was black. My dad was black. My mom's mom was black. My dad's mom was black. My dad's dad, my mom's dad, they were all black. So I'm black. Is there white in my blood? By all means. I'm a, a product of slavery in America. There's no doubt that I have whiteness in my blood. <clears throat> but in terms of my immediate past history, my forebears are all black. Um, and people, some people are surprised to hear that. And that's yet another function of racism in America. Um, the, the whole how close to black are you um, question. Look, black is black. I, I don't have it easier because I'm light skinned. I know folks would argue with that and and say it's different, but I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. I've I've had more racist experience than most of my friends who, you know, some are darker than me. Um, I've had more experiences of discrimination and prejudice than a lot of my friends who are darker than me. Um, there's no for me no degree of of ease with being a light-skinned black person. And I say that knowing that some dark-skinned black folks have had a really rough experience. And I'm gonna to talk to you about my life too, to, and you will see that I've had a really rough experience too, and yet I am still here. Um, as a teenager, black kids learn what it really means to be black. I was a straight-A student uh, all the way through middle school and high school. Uh, in the 10th grade, I transferred from one of the best schools in the city of Detroit to my neighborhood high school. Um, I had never really had any run-ins with the police that were um, negative. I had never been arrested or anything up to 10th grade. Um, and, and so I, I was fairly naive about what it meant to be, you know, uh, I, I was raised with the police are here to protect you mentality. Although my mom did talk to me in middle school about you know, making sure that I was respectful and that I didn't give the police a reason to beat me or uh, arrest me or take me in. Um, I, I didn't have any negative experiences with the police, you know, beyond, you know, the, the, you know, occasional hello or stopping by the store and running into the police. Um, in 10th grade, I was walking home from school with a bunch of my friends. It was my first day of school at the neighborhood high school. And uh, an unmarked police car pulled up and all of my friends took off running. And I didn't run because we hadn't done anything. Um, and, and the police jumped out of the car and it was a car, a group of police officers that we called the Big Four, the Big Four, um, meaning the Big Four. And all four of them jump out the car and they grabbed me and they said, oh, so you ain't got no reason to run? Like you, you just gonna walk while we, when we pull up? And they took me not running as a sign of disrespect. So they put me in the car and they drove me to a, an alley and they proceeded to beat me. And one of the things they said when they were beating me is we gonna teach you to run when we come nigga. And you know, they didn't, they didn't beat me bad enough to have to go to the hospital but they, they, they put a beating on me. <clears throat> they put me back in the car and they drove me to a neighborhood that wasn't friendly to folks from my neighborhood. And they dropped me off in the alley and said, hope you get home safe. And um, I learned from that day that when the police pull up, even if you ain't done nothing, you better run. You better run because your life could depend on it. You better do everything in your power to get away. Because if you don't, they will get you. And I didn't learn this from my friends. I didn't learn this from my mother. I didn't learn this from the streets. I learned this from the police. And I'm not the only black man in America who learned this lesson from the police. So when I hear people talk about, well, why was he running if he didn't do anything? Because our lives are taken for doing nothing. George Floyd tried to pass a counterfeit $20 bill, allegedly. He was killed for $20. He wasn't out there committing violent crimes. He wasn't out there beating on nobody. He wasn't out there uh, calling people out of their name. He wasn't, you know, being a huge disturbance. He he allegedly tried to pass a twenty dollar bill, and his life was taken. So, when you see these interactions, when you hear 
these stories, understand that black folks have had a far different experience with police than most people in America. And that for ages, the police have been the cagers, the folks in power to keep us in our place, the folks in power to take our bodies and our lives for any, any minute step out of line or any offense that they sense, whether it's real, true, or imagined, um, they are empowered to take our lives. And they wield that power knowingly. Those police officers who beat me in the, in the 10th grade, they knew what they were doing. It wasn't accidental. It wasn't you know, coincidental. Uh, they, it was with all intention to teach me a lesson that they were in charge, and that if I loved living, that I better not cross them. And if I did run across them, I better do my best to get away because there's a chance I might not live in interaction through an interaction with them. So I, 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 I tell that story um, to contextualize what we're seeing from black folks and the police today, um, to contextualize some of the demands that the, the, the demands that the Black Lives Matter movement are making around defunding police, around enforcing or enforcing accountability, um, and 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 not sitting down to take the "we will, we will" message any longer. We're not going to wait anymore. Our lives are in danger today. Um, the other thing that that interaction with the police did was push me into a gang, because if I couldn't protect myself by myself, then I needed to make sure that the police might have some fear of messing with me. Uh, and that was, you know, the gang. That was my push into the gang. It wasn't a love of crime. It wasn't the need to do, to make money. It wasn't that I couldn't get a job. It was that I feared the police. And the only way to kind of equalize that was to have some protection for myself. Um, and that was another negative introduced to me by the police, um, introduced into my life and my family's life by a bad interactions with the police. And again, this wasn't an isolated incident. So some folks would say, well, why didn't you go to this? Or why didn't you go to that? First of all, I was in the 10th grade. Second of all, there were other people like me who had similar experiences and nothing ever came of that. So what hope did I have as a 10th grade black boy of getting something done when grown men and women couldn't get any justice in that system? Um, you know, also in high school, it wasn't good enough for me to be excellent. Like I said, I was a straight A student. I was a, a colonel in the JROTC unit. I was the brigade commander for the city of Detroit. And it wasn't enough to be excellent, you know? Um, and, and that was tough because my mom raised us to do our best in everything and said, if we do our best, we'll have a good life. And, you know, some interactions in high school proved different to me prove that even if I do my best, there's still something blocking me. In the 11th grade, I went to my counselor, uh, Mr. Howard, and asked him if uh, I could take the SAT, if he could schedule the SATs so I could go to college. And he told me I wasn't college material. I was a straight A student. I was, a, at that time, a lieutenant colonel in the JROTC. Um, and I wasn't college material, so he would not schedule SATs for me. Back then, you had to have your counselor schedule the SATs. You couldn't do it yourself. And he wouldn't do it. So I went back to him a few months later and said, well, you know, I get that you don't think I'm college material. Okay. Would you write me a letter of recommendation for the military academy? And he said no, that I wasn't good enough for the military academy. I was the, the, the unit commander at my high school ROTC unit. I was on track to be the brigade commander. I would be the brigade commander a year later, but I was not military academy material in his mind. He was white, I was black, we were inner city high school, and this opportunity was denied to me. So even when we're excellent, even when we're the best, even when we're at the top, there is something that is holding us back in America. Uh, and again, I, I just, I'm just going to keep repeating, this is not an isolated story. I am not unique in this way. There is nothing unique about me in having these experiences. Um, I simply came 
into the knowledge and the understanding that if you're black in America, you have to do more to get to get equality. Uh, you have to be 10 times better. You have to be 20 times better. And that was reinforced later on in my life, which I'm going to talk about. I want to stop here um, at the halfway point and see if we have any folks who have any questions about anything I've said right now. Um, if anybody wants to share, uh, you know, an understanding uh, and ask a question, I'm going to give some time here. If I don't see any questions, if Bertini or uh, Lorraine don't chime in with any questions, and uh, I will continue. Yeah, and you can type in any questions in the chat box that's on the side or questions box. So far, we have them. Okay, I'm going to continue. Um, so after high school, I joined the Marine Corps. I knew that I needed to get out of Detroit. If I wasn't going to college, if I wasn't going to the military academy, um, with the life that I had between 10th grade and 12th grade, um, there was one path, two pathways. One was to jail, the other one was death. It was Detroit in the crack era. Um, the crack epidemic was strong. Uh, there was so much drugs, so much crime, so much violence that I knew that I had to get out of Detroit. And we were poor, and I knew I needed to get out of my mother's house so that you know she could better take care of my brothers and sisters. And so I joined the Marine Corps. And even in the Marine Corps, the first military service to desegregate, um, I ran into racism. You know, in boot camp, the drill instructors, they do their best to take race out of the training process. So they tell us we're all green. So one day the drill instructor saying, hey, you guys got to work together. You're all green. This is a Marine Corps. You're all trying to be Marines and all Marines are green. Um, and then the next day, you know, uh, I have a drill instructor who says, hey, Wilson, go give me that dark green Marine. Wyatt. Uh, I didn't understand. I mean, what, what do you mean, dark green marine, sir? I need you to go get me the dark green marine named Wyatt. And I said, sir, what do you mean, dark green? The black one, Wilson, the black one. So while the military does its best to take race out of its training process and out of its whole dynamic, they re-inject it in, in, in different ways. So we're all green, but I'm a light green Marine, or I'm a dark green Marine, or he's a yellow Marine. You know, it's it's there. Even in our in our military service, which is sworn to, to protect this country, to protect and defend the Constitution, even when we are giving our lives for this country, the racism is there. I, I had the fortune and the misfortune to go to war uh, while I was in the military and, you know, I had an experience where all the black guys were put in one tent because none of the white guys wanted to be in, in that close quarters with the black guys. And when we complained about having to be in the, the same tent and having, you know, every time a new black guy came, no matter how many people were in our tent, they put them, so our space got smaller and smaller. We were told to stay in our place. We were told that decisions were made by the, the leadership. The leadership was all white. And it's unfortunate that you all will have to live in this cramped space, but you're in the black tent. Um, and that was when I decided to get out of the military. Because if I'm at war fighting for this country, fighting to defend the Constitution, fighting to defend the lives of everyone here, um, and I have to be subjected, subjected to uh, you know, differential treatment because of the color of my skin. That wasn't something I wanted to be involved in. Um, and so I, I left the military and went to work as a defense contractor. And there again, ran into racism. I was a supervisor. I supervised a team of about nine or 10 folks. And whenever I asked for a promotion, I was told I had to prove myself. I was supervising people. I was making money for the organization. I would, all my projects were successful. But every time I asked for a promotion, I was told, you got to prove yourself, Wilson. We're not seeing enough. You got to prove yourself. Well, one year, a white man who worked for me, who reported to me, who I supervised and evaluated, went and asked for a promotion. 
and he got it. And he was told the reason he got the promotion was they wanted to give him a chance to prove himself. And I was livid because for four years, I've been told I need to prove myself. And yet a white man who works for me is promoted and told, we're giving you a chance to prove yourself. Meaning that although I was higher, better, more efficient, more skilled at leading, that wasn't the proof as a black that was necessary to get the promotion. They gave it to a white guy who I then had to report to. The person who worked for me became my boss so he could prove that he was a leader. And this is in corporate America in the 90s. Um, so needless to say, I got fed up with that and I left that organization as well. Um, it's, it's, it's sometimes demoralizing and depressing. Um, and a lot of folks will allow that to sink them. Uh, but my mom prepared me. The small things she said growing up, the life lessons that she would give us on Sunday or Saturday, they stuck with me. And she always said, don't let nobody steal your joy. Don't let nobody steal your pride. You do the best you can do and you, you do the best you can do and you know what that is and you live with that. And so um, it, it didn't sink me. It didn't take away my ability to be successful. It just said I needed to be successful somewhere else. You can be young and black in America, but you gotta know your place. Um, on my first day out of the Marine Corps and at my new job, I went to lunch at a Denny's in Los Angeles. And there was a, a, a another person there. There were quite a few people there, but there was a guy there who was really upset. And he was mad that they sat me at the bar with other white men. And as a result of his anger, he put a 38 caliber handgun to my head and said he was gonna kill me that day for sitting at that counter. What he didn't know is that I had just got out the Marine Corps and I wasn't afraid of a gun. And I knew how to use a gun. I don't know how to take a gun apart. Um, needless to say, he didn't leave Denny's with that gun. Um, but, but the message was, stay in your place. And this is in Los Angeles, California, on the West Coast, the liberal West Coast, the free West Coast. Um, and here I am with a gun to my head for being black, sitting at the wrong counter at Denny's. You can be young and black in America, but know your place. You can be young and black in America, but not in Culver City. On August 23rd, 1996, I was driving to my office to prepare for a trip internationally, going to Korea the next day. At 2 a.m. in the morning, I pulled up next to a Culver City police car and I was listening to, to Prince, uh, some music, Prince, and um, I just felt the presence of something mean. And I look over and this cop is leaning out of his window, screaming and yelling at me about what the hell am I doing in Culver City at 2 a.m. in the morning. I told him I'm going to my office. And he started calling me the N-word and started telling me I need to get the hell out of Culver City. Do I know where I'm at? Who do I think I am? And then he started threatening my life. And I went to get on the freeway. He turned in behind me and he put his lights on. And I was so scared because of the threats he had made that if I pulled over, I knew that I was going to die. Um, I didn't pull over. I just did 35 miles an hour on the 405 freeway. Eventually, he pulled off and went on the 10. But I was scared for my life, so scared that I called 911. And here's how you know that the higher ups know what's going on. Nobody. I called 911. I reported the incident, told them where we were at. Nobody ever contacted me after that night to find out what happened. How do you call 911 and tell them you feel fear for your life and tell them what's going on and nobody ever calls you to do an investigation? These folks know how these cops are treating us out here in the street and they don't care or they don't want to do anything about it. You can be young and black in America, but don't be young and black and know your rights. 
Because in San Diego, if you start telling the police what your rights are, it can lead to being hit in the head with a baton. I've had officers tell me that I was smart and uppity. I've had them tell me to just shut the F up. Don't know your rights. Don't start quoting your rights. It will get you killed as a black person in America if you tell the police you know what your rights are and how they should be treating you. You perceived as not being a person who wants to live, but a person who wants to have power over the police. And that's just not the case if you're white in America. When you start talking about your rights as a white American, they start backing off, they start backing down. But if you start talking about your rights as a black American, it's intimidating, it's, it's, it's angering, it's demeaning to the police, um, and you're being uppity or smart ass. You can be black and young in America, but don't piss off Ken in La Mesa. Three weeks ago, I was driving too slowly for a man who got out of his car and proceeded to curse me out and call me out of my name. In the process of me saying, sir, please don't call me out of my name, I referred to him as sir. I was very polite. I was courteous. I know where I was. I was in La Mesa near Santee. He told me he was going to call the police on me. And he said it with such vile indignation that I knew that he was threatening my life. He knew, he knew at the moment that interactions between Black people and the police are uh can be negative and he used that threat to call the police as a threat on my life here in san diego right here in la mesa don't piss people off with your slow driving black folks don't be in somebody's way because your life can be taken that's that's the message that it gave me so as i close out my my talk you know i just want to say this celebration of juneteenth to to have it be called a holiday is new for us. It's always been a holiday for us, but to hear so many people celebrating it as a holiday and uh, and 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 reveling in the injustice of freedom to Black folks, um, it's kind of perplexing to me. Um, I'm glad to be here with you today. I'm 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 hoping that it won't be a one-year thing where people celebrate it today because there's so many uprisings across this country. I hope it can become something meaningful in America that, you know, folks finally start to say, yes, Black people have been done wrong. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement is one way we're doing that, to bring attention to the wrongs and the injustices that Black people live with. Uh, but just in the stories that I've shared with you about my life, over my life, you can understand why there might be some skepticism on people's part, Black folks' part, as to how long this is going to last, how long are we going to see messages from Target and Walmart and other, you know, mega corporations that lift up Black lives? Or are they just using it for a marketing moment? Because the one thing we don't want to be is somebody's marketing moment. We don't want to be a way that they can make more money, that they can come out of COVID stronger. These are our real lived lives, and we need rights, we need oversight and accountability. We need uh, police officers to understand what it means to be Black in America. We need the community to understand and stand with us, to say no more. Being Black in America should not be a death sentence. Being Black in America should not be a sentence of being impoverished for your whole life. Even with all these things that happened to me, I've managed to carve out some success, but not by myself. I've had the support and the wisdom and the teachings of Black folks before me, of Black folks beside me, of mentors who are not Black, of mentors and friends who are not Black. I haven't done this on my own. I'm not just a successful Black man. What you see is the success of a large group of people who have come together to make sure that I have what I need to outlast, to overcome the racism in America and still be successful and still provide a way of life for my family. My hope is that today some of you will join in saying no more. America needs to change and we're gonna make sure that it happens. Um, so 
I'm ready to take questions. I hope that I've inspired someone. Um, and, and yeah, let's open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Christopher, um, for your transparency and just letting us get a glimpse into your life in on the West Coast. We do have a question, but I just want to remind everybody that this presentation, as well as future presentations, are recorded and it will be made available to you soon. So one question we have for you, Christopher, is how did you overcome this message, this message of individuals like your teacher that the what they conveyed to you that was negative, what was your motivation? So I'm glad that question was asked. Um, and not because of the nature of the, que the the actual question, but the nature of the question suggests that they were individuals. I want to say to you that all these examples, if you look deeper, they're institutions of racism in America. My high school experience was the educational institution. It's not just me, and it's and Mr. Howard wasn't just an individual. Mr. Howard represented education in Detroit. There are there are millions of Mr. Howards across this country. So it's hard for me to answer a question about an individual when I know that there are other Black people, my wife, my brother, my sister, who have experienced the same thing from other people, not just Mr. Howard. Uh, but, but my motivation was my mother. I, I give all credit to my mom. She, she raised me to want something more out of this life. We grew up poor. My mom graduated high school and struggled to get through college. Uh, she, she eventually got an associate's degree, uh, but it took her her whole life in her 50s. She got her associate degree in her 50s. It took her her whole life and she didn't want that denied to her children. And so from a very early age, she stressed the importance of education. She stressed the importance of doing our best. And, my, and she really was a source of my motivation because I knew that there was something better in this world for me. Um, and I wasn't going to let him take it from me. Uh, I'm not going to let them take it from me. The institutions, if you look at the experience of the police, the police are an institution in this country. Those weren't individual officers. Those officers represented a mindset, a mentality towards Black people that is trained and ingrained in police officers. Um, if you look at the Marine Corps, the military is an institution. There are tons and tons of people who have a very real racist experience in their military uh, careers. Um, if you look at the, the corporate America, pick, that's an institution. These aren't just individuals acting. Th these are institutions at play. These are people representing institutional approaches and, and, and perceived notions about what it means to be Black and how they have to defend against blackness and and we have to be motivated to end it we have to know that there's something better there's something higher um and not let other folks steal our joy not let them steal our pride Great. so i hope i answered your question yes we have another question and comment it seems there is hope for some prevention and mitigation of racism through better educating our children the history our school teach is not comprehensive and not accurate enough. My daughter has not been taught Juneteenth at school except for at home. Do you know of any good resources of educational resources that parents can layer into history education for grade school kids? Thank you so much for being here and sharing. Yes, um, thank you for that question. I agree. It, it's it's. Our, our education system is failing us, especially when it comes to history, because the history that is taught, there's a saying, a Greek philosopher, I think it was Greek, once said, uh, to the victor goes the spoils, or maybe that was a Revolutionary War person. But the, the concept is, is very known in Greek philosophy that whoever wins gets to write history. And unfortunately, Black people haven't been winning. Um, and so what what happens is the history that's taught in the schools is one that's made to fit a mainstream experience in America. Uh, one way to counter that is, especially in history, is to get Howard Zinn's book, People's History of the United States. There are um, grade level lessons, uh, you know, in a in a workbook that you can get, and it's a grade level appropriate um, that help teach the people's history, because 
you know, it's not just Black folks' history that's left out. What about Native history? Native Americans, Indigenous history is also left out of our education, right? The Filipino story is left out of our education. The Chinese story is left out of our education. Hell, the Latino story is left out of our education, right? Um, and so Howard Zinn does a great job of covering the people's history of the United States, and I would suggest starting there. Awesome. Why do you think so many Black people and Latinos have a sense of shared history? What can we do? Oh, great question. Um, we know that this, this war against Black and Latino folks didn't start in the 60s. It didn't even start in the 1800s. It started in the 1400s when Europeans left Europe in search of gold, in search of spices, in search of resources um, and land. Uh, and I think Black and Latino folks have a, a commonality in their experience because uh, Europeans landed in Africa and set about a course of destruction. Europeans landed in the Americas and set about a course of destruction. Um, and that's a very similar experience. Um, it just so happens that, you know, e on the East Coast, Africans were enslaved. And on the West Coast, the conquistadors and the Spaniards enslaved the indigenous. Um, and Latino peoples are a, a, the end result of the, the oppression of Europeans. Um, and, and so that what we see is Africans, Af African-Americans knowing that history and Latinos knowing that history, and it's a shared history. Um, there were Africans in Latin America, African enslaved folks in Latin America prior to American slavery. Um, and so, yeah, it is a shared history and it's one that we need to learn more about and talk more about um, because the system would have us fight each other. I call it the oppression Olympics. Who's the most oppressed, right? Well, we're all oppressed. And if we stay divided, we stay oppressed. It's when we get together and the system knows. The system knows that if we get together, it will lose. And so the effort is to keep us divided, have us fighting for crumbs amongst each other. Uh, when there's a whole big pie out there, why are we fighting over one slice? We need to fight for more of the pie, not how we split the pie that we get. Okay. And we have time for one more question. Do you have suggestions for how white folks can talk to racist family members? The narrative of criminalization continues to be thrown around without acknowledging the criminal behavior of the system. Yeah, bravely. White folks can talk to family members with bravery. Um, if you have a difference of opinion, if you have a different experience, I think you know, if you want to be an ally and you want to embrace that allyship, um, I think talking to family is where I always direct people to start. It's not enough to come out to the marches. It's not enough to hold up the signs. Um, we know that white folks, when it's just white folks, talk differently than when people of color, when black folks are there. And so having that conversation and not needing a black face to be the reason for the conversation is an act of bravery um and you, it might get you treated poorly it might create a, an argument or disagreement but we need white folks to have that conversation because there's nothing that i can say in that home that i don't exist that's going to change anybody's heart or mind um we need white folks to talk to white folks because that's when hearts and minds change and that's what that was the difference in the 60s and that can that is the difference now. I won't say that can be the difference. I mean, when you look at who's protesting, when you look at who's new out there in the streets, you see a lot more white faces. And that's that's good. Uh, but those same white faces need to be at home having those conversations. Don't wash the Black Lives Matter off your car before you go home. Keep it on there and pull up in your driveway and see what your family has to say. And then have that conversation. Thank you so much, Christopher. On behalf of the All One, Dr. Bronner's family, thank you for being here. Thank you for your transparency. This will not be the last time you join us for a presentation and we look forward to continually working with you.